Well, thank you all for joining us today. I'm Nick O'Young, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery at Emory University School of Medicine. This is a joint CNS NAS podcast that will explore management of facial pain, including diagnosis and treatment options. And the overall goal is to really discuss and discover collaborative opportunities amongst our discipline so that we can deliver excellent patient care efficiently. So I'm here with Dr. Nick Bullis and Dr. Samir Naruz. Uh, Dr. Bullis, would you kindly introduce yourself? I'm Nick Bullis, uh, also at Emory University, uh, professor of neurosurgery, uh, and I've specialized in the treatment of both uh, trigeminal neuralgia, atypical trigeminal neuralgia, and other neuropathic pain, uh, pain of the face. Terrific. Dr. Naruz, if, if you can be so kind. Sure. I'm Sam Naruz. I'm a, a professor of uh, anesthesia and surgery at New Med and uh, OUCAM. Uh, I'm a headache specialist in uh, Akron, Ohio. Terrific. Well, welcome to you both. Really excited to have this opportunity to kind of listen between, um, to, to hear both of your expert opinions on this. Facial pain is obviously a very challenging topic, very, very uh, it spans quite a number of diagnoses. So I'll start off with you, Dr. Nuruz. Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about the, the, the pain, uh, the facial pain patients that you see and how you kind of take in information and for, formulate a, a diagnostic and treatment plan. Yeah, I have to start by saying that a patient with facial pain or complex facial pain syndrome, they are not easy. And unfortunately, we don't see them early on uh, at the beginning or the onset of the disease. Usually, they will check with the primary care physician uh, and they undergo lots of dental workup and TMJ stuff. And by the time we see them, it might be late in the game. And I cannot claim that there is no single uh, specialty can claim or can own a uh, pain patient. It's across different disciplines, ENT, eye, ophthalmologist, dermatologist, neurologist, rheumatologist, neurologist, headache specialist, uh, you name it. So uh, it, it has to be uh, really a multimodal approach in, in a specialized pain clinic, honestly, to be fair to the patients, because I feel bad for those patients. They go through multiple uh, specialties, spend years before they can come actually to a definitive diagnosis before treatment. And I think this is the magic world. If you can have a little algorithm in our minds that will work through it to reach the proper diagnosis, because I think this is the only positive thing that we can help those patients. Because unfortunately, most of the pain disorders, we cannot find a curative. We can make their symptoms manageable, but it has to start with a, an appropriate label because once you put a diagnosis in the patient chart, the patient will inherit this diagnosis diagnosis, even whenever they go out of state to see someone else, it set up the stage in the wrong base. So my recommendation that even if I see patient coming from out of state, you have to start from the scratch. Appropriate history, appropriate history, history, and then examination and definitely imaging if needed. And most of the pain physicians or neurologists, primary care physicians, they are familiar with the red flag symptoms and sign that will require imaging for headaches, but for facial pain, it's different. It has to be very systematic. I mean, do you want me to elaborate? How can I approach my own patients at this stage or? Uh, yeah, why, why don't we jump to Dr. Bullis? Uh, you know, Dr. Bullis, you, you, you see the same kind of scenario too when patients kind of arrive late to you as well. Um, you know, taking a good history, as Dr. Naruz uh, talked about, is extremely important. But what are the, uh, the what are the steps that you go through in in terms of history, imaging, and uh, kind of your surgical workup? So I, th I think for for neurosurgeons, um, the the neurosurgical management, general neurosurgical management, primarily uh, targets trigeminal neuralgia. As you know, we've got a wide array of, of, of operations that can help for trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, and and we, we can deal with this continuum from type one trigeminal neuralgia to uh, type two or a typical trigeminal neuralgia. We do better with type one than type two, uh, but 
I think when when patients come to us um, to to um, augment on what Dr. Naruza said, uh, neurosurgeons need to be on their guard that that what they're dealing with is in fact idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia, as opposed to uh, a secondary neuropathic facial pain syndrome of the face uh, or other form of of uh, facial pain syndrome uh, that can be the result of of tumors in the skull base, uh, tumors in the basal cisterns, um, chronic sinus disease, uh, chronic ophthalmologic disease, um, uh, post-viral, post-repetic neuralgia, uh, or, or simply atypical facial pain, which is a diagnosis uh, of exclusion. It's a bit of a wastebasket diagnosis, and it's, it's one that we all dread um, regardless. Um, so I think as neurosurgeons, uh, we need to be on the lookout for these various uh, non-idiopathic trigeminal uh, syndromes and, uh, and in particular, uh, rely on, uh, as Dr. Neruza said, our, our, our uh, associated disciplines, not be afraid to send patients back if we're, to them if we're concerned about this. Uh, and, and I think that we shouldn't operate on, on patients until, uh, frankly, we've had an MRI scan uh, with and without contrast, uh, examining uh, the the uh, cisterns. Uh, but having said that, we need to be on guard and remember that facial pain is not just going to come from uh, these skull-based tumors that we as neurosurgeons are trained to look for, but there's also pathology outside the skull. Um, and in particular, I think uh, with regard to, to approaching this as neurosurgeons, uh, first and foremost, we need to to divide these syndromes into paroxysmal and non-paroxysmal states. Um, granted, uh, compression from uh, tumors can cause paroxysmal states, uh, and um, and hence the need for 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 imaging. Uh, having said that, the the this array of of techniques that that we can bring to bear are largely effective for paroxysmal uh, pain states. Um, and even in the case that it, it's not trigeminal neuralgia, the non-paroxysmal pain states, um, there are other uh, approaches, and we can get into this when we talk about the, the operations. That's terrific. Dr. Naruz, I, I, I was wondering, uh, you know, as us as neurosurgeons, we'll, we'll kind of focus on neurovascular conflict at the trigeminal ganglia. Do you, in your practice, also get MRIs and look for that, as well as perhaps other imaging to look for some of the other pathologies that may not be on our radar uh, as much? Yeah. I mean, the general approach to uh, orofacial pain in general, um, I'd like to get a detailed history. And I will discuss some of the pitfalls because I don't think we can go over all the syndromes in, 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 uh, in one hour even. So usually I would like to know the, the, uh, what, what happened before triggering the pain. Was it there is trauma, uh, rash, uh, dental workup? So uh, what triggered the pain and the characteristics of the pain? As Dr. Bull said, uh, we want to know what's the timing, the onset, the duration, the episode. Is it minutes? Is it seconds? It's hours? Do you have a pain-free interval? How long or not? any associated symptoms, autonomic features, uh, uh, oral, TMJ issues, ENT, vertigo, tinnitus, can lead to maybe tumors in the area. Uh, so associated symptoms imported and the progression was started episodic and then becomes more continuous. Uh, the pitfall that I wanna mention is not every face pain is neuropathic pain or trigeminal neuralgia or idiopathic persistent face pain. Honestly, history is very critical because I would say the most common cause of facial pain is primary headache disorders. Migraine patient, they can present with face pain and allodynia even. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's, it's really not uncommon. And so asking about typical migraine history, typical uh, migraine symptoms, the response to migraine medication might be just a trial to see. And the new CGRP agent, they're very helpful with the facial allodynia with migraine headaches. Serfcogenic headaches can be with mandibular pain, especially C2 neuralgia. So you have to rule out even disorders in the upper cervical spine. 
uh, special C2 neuralgia A1 uh, atlantoaxial joint can be present also with the even like a nail poking from the occiput to the eye. It's not cluster headache. It's not idiopathic facial pain. On the other hand, so this is one pitfall that you have to rule out primary headache disorders, honestly. Uh, and trigeminal neuralgia can be confused with those sharp uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, which is another primary headache disorder. So we wanna know, you might need to give a test trial of Endocent for a few days and see if this is one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalalgia sunk or not. Because I order lots of imaging, sure, if you wanna uh, rule out the classic trigeminal neuralgia. But I wanna make emphasis is that not every vascular conflict in the MRI will be the cause of the facial pain. We just jump sometimes on it based on someone that knows the patient with trigeminal neuralgia and then you see an image. Uh, I think there's few years ago, there was an, a good study that showed that there is conflict on the other side, the same or even worse, but there is no symptoms. So maybe it's just a coincidence. That's why you have to correlate the image to the uh, presentation. And this what triggered the international classification of headache disorder, the new one is that, as Dr. Pulis said, there's trigeminal neuralgia and there's trigeminal neuropathy or painful trigeminal neuropathy. And trigeminal neuralgia used to say, it's classic, you have to have a vascular conflict. Now, no, it divided into three things. Classic, which has the neurovascular conflict, and then idiopathic, which is typical trigeminal neuralgia clinically diagnosed, but the MRI is fine, it's, it's normal. And there's secondary, which is typical from uh, shingles. The, uh, sorry, the secondary, uh, secondary causes MS or tumors. Shingles actually uh, trigeminal neuropathy. So trigeminal neuropathy will be uh, shingles, traumatic, or idiopathic. So this is the, the, this is the main uh, focus of reaching an appropriate diagnosis, because if it turned to be a classic trigeminal neuralgia, failure of conservative treatment with pharmacological agent, then definitely I would say the definitive treatment will be surgical uh, taking care of this neurovascular conflict. But on the other hand, if it's idiopathic, there is no negative imaging, but typical symptom, then you try pharmacological management, maybe interventional uh, options, and we can talk about it later. So this is what I wanna emphasize that rule out uh, for a fresh uh, patient with orofacial pain, we need to rule out primary headache disorder, whether migraine with allodynias or uh, um, cervicogenic headache or upper cervical uh, disorders referred through the C2 to the angle of the mouth or even the cheek. And trigeminal neuralgia, we need to distinguish it from two things, painful trigeminal neuropathy, and the other thing will be the short lancinating uh, trigeminal autonomic cephalalgias, which usually respond well to endocin or uh, SPG later on. That's terrific, Dr. Naruz. Um, yeah, ex really important points. Um, it's, it's very easy to get anchored to a diagnosis when a patient gets comes to your office. Uh, Dr. Bullis, so let's say we have a typical uh, uh, lancinating uh, trigeminal neuralgia. What, what's, what's your step in terms of determining uh, uh, treatment and uh, treatment and surgical options for, for such a patient, uh, if you can tell us that? Sure, but uh, just let me loop back a little bit. I mean, again, my, my assumption is that this is largely a, a podcast that can be listened to by neurosurgeons, and, and uh, I think the average neurosurgeon um, doesn't necessarily have the diagnostic depth uh, of Dr. Naruz and, and isn't going to necessarily see this all the time. So I think, I think that let me try to dumb it down. Um, and granted, I'm, probably, I'm probably going to lose, lose something uh, by, by dumbing it down. But, but the bottom line is this. Um, paroxysmal immediate onset pain states have a high probability of responding to our, our various ablative uh, armamentarium. Uh, and, and that may be true, even if, particularly if these are triggered paroxysmal states, um, even if it's secondary and it's coming from something else. Um, whereas the, the more constant um, component of, the, of these mixed states or states that are simply constant, uh, I'm, I'm fairly opposed uh, to the use of, of ablative approaches. Um, 
period. And, and so then the question becomes, well, what do we have um, that is not the classic ablative approaches? Um, and by ablative approaches, I mean glycerol, balloon, radiofrequency. These are the percutaneous approaches, uh, open approaches that include open partial rhizotomy or internal neurolysis, which I feel is a, is a type of ablation or controlled damage to the trigeminal system. Uh, and then all of the radiosurgical approaches and, and perhaps focused ultrasound as, as we see it emerge. Um, so I, I think that, that we have an enormous number of, of potentially damaging or ablative approaches. They can be useful, whether it's primary or secondary, if it's triggered in paroxysmal. Um, but you need to know whether it's secondary because, uh, you know, if there's an underlying tumor, that needs to be treated as well. Um, and that primary diagnosis may give hints into other approaches that are non, non-surgical. But I, I, think, I think it's okay as neurosurgeons to rely on, on our referring doctors uh, and say, okay, you've seen a good neurologist. That neurologist has not defined a medical therapy for it or has you on medical therapy, but it's not enough. Um, am I going to consider surgery? First foremost, is this paroxysmal and triggered? Consider ablation. Is this uh, primarily constant? This is where I think we should be considering neuromodulation. And, and frankly, uh, neuromodulation is, is a work in progress for neurosurgery. Uh, as, as you know, um, most of the approaches that I've been writing about are, are off-label, all of them, uh, that the traditional neurosurgical approaches to constant refractory neuropathic pain have really targeted the nucleus caudalis, uh, and those include trigeminal tractotomy and, and caudalis stres. Uh, but these, these procedures are, are not commonly practiced out there, uh, frankly, have high uh, neurological morbidity and, and require a specialized team, specialized training. Um, so I think for uh, these constant pain states, um, the neuromodulation options that we've been writing about are, are excellent options and most neurosurgeons have the skills to employ them. That's great. Uh, Dr. Naruz, for these uh, constant type trigeminal uh, of, I should say, facial pains, uh, is, there, is there any middle ground in terms of uh, the treatments that you offer uh, that, that's, that, that's not uh, lesser invasive perhaps? Uh, again, there was evolution in our understanding of the trigeminal nerve disorders. And uh, as Dr. Bruhl said, the proxismal pattern, it's very important because it predicts the response to uh, some of the surgical options. But we used to say that the patient has to have pain-free interval between the episodes. We don't do this anymore. We, there is a subclassification of classic trigeminal neuralgia associated with continuous pain. So it still can be neurovascular. And if the MRI imaging is, is clear, there is an, uh, a cause, there is a conflict, I will still refer the patient to neurosurgeon. If the patient has classical trigeminal neuralgia, even with a continuous pain between them, you guys know better, it might be the, pro uh, the prognosis might not be as good as if it's just purely proxismal, but it's still trigeminal neuralgia, not painful trigeminal neuralgia. For the patient that they failed surgical options, if they have neurovascular conflict, or uh, if they don't have and it's idiopathic uh, trigeminal neuralgia, uh, the pharmacological management, we always say like try the uh, carbamazepine, the oxycarbamazepine, this is the first uh, class. Baclofen might be helpful as well. Uh, gabapentoid, it's worth to try it. If the patient failed those pharmacological options, uh, I, I, I do a lot of the gazerian ganglion uh, block as a diagnostic first. Um, I get referrals even before gamma knife. I'm not sure have how the response to just a simple, simple local anesthetic injection. If the response is good and the patient is uh, aware, I mean, informed consent is very important before the neuroablative, as Dr. Puri said, they are not without significant potential complications. I don't do glycerol anymore. Uh, we used to in the past, but now our approach is usually radiofrequency neuromodulation. And we knew from our experience and the published literature that we're trying to avoid high temperature. We used to use 90 degrees. 
we went down to 80 for a while. And actually now I do not use more than 70 degrees. Uh, I'm not aware of bad anesthesia de la Rosa with uh, radio frequency ablation below 70 degrees. <coughs> so we, we do the typical uh, multiple lesions. You examine the patient between the lesion to make sure the cornea is fine. Uh, but um, my advice would be to obtain, take your time obtaining the informed consent because uh, I reviewed cases that the patient said, oh, I was not aware of this, that's possible. But it is possible the patient will have hypothesia uh, for a while, for weeks. And I see the Rosa, thankfully it's, it's uh, one digit number, 1% maybe, but with low temperature uh, between 60, 70 degrees, maybe 80 degrees in the recurrent patient, Typically, if they work, typically the patient usually come between 12 months to 18 months for another one. And uh, I offer this neuroablative procedure only for elderly patients that they cannot eat, they cannot drink. I have patients that they have to have a stoma to feed them uh, because how bad it is. So in those patients, you, you weigh the, the pros and cons. You have radiofrequency ablation. They are 90 years old. You cannot have a craniotomy or a brain surgery. So you weigh the pros and cons. If, if this is making them functioning, um, drinking and eating, yes, they will accept the risk. But on the other hand, a young female patient with questionable uh, idiopathic facial neuropathic pain, I will never offer a neuroablative procedure, maybe neuromodulation. Uh, after ruling out psychological disorders, uh, I would offer neuromodulation. And nowadays we have few uh, on the market, few companies that they offer peripheral neuromodulation. They are not FDA approved for headaches or cranial neuralgia, but if it's a nerve disorder or nerve injury, I think you can uh, uh, get it approved. Uh, we use peripheral neuromodulation. It's becoming more popular than before because not majority of pain physicians are not comfortable handling the gazillion ganglion, uh, even for a uh, neuroablative procedure. The, as Dr. Pruder said, uh, it's off label to do the gazillion neuromodulation. Although I had few patients in the past, it, it's, it's a beautiful indication if you guys reach out to uh, a custom lead. Uh, this would be perfect, honestly. Uh, but uh, again, my, my two options would be either uh, radio frequency ablation, 70 at the most, I might go to 80 degrees. If, if uh, I know the patient, patient come back twice, seven degrees does not last the whole year, uh, I might go to 80 degrees. Uh, peripheral neuromodulation, especially for traumatic peripheral uh, cranial uh, neuropathy, for uh, post-traumatic neurology, although the prognosis usually is not as good. Um, for idiopathic, persistent idiopathic facial pain, usually it's autonomic mediated. We don't know for sure. I would prefer to go with autonomic ganglion for the uh, idiopathic facial, persistent idiopathic facial pain. Usually they're targeting the sphenopalatine ganglion, whether again, radio frequency, you can start pulse it with 45 degrees or go thermal for 80 degrees, or there are, or there were some neuromodulation products for it. Dr. Bulls, um, you, you're really leading the charge in terms of uh, neuromodulation for the face. Can you tell us a little bit about your technique uh, for implanting those? Sure. Um, and and I, although I do want to comment, because I really left out commenting on microvascular decompression in, in, in my earlier statement, um, in just to, again, to dumb it down, um, I, I, in contrast to the ablative procedures, in these sort of type two trigeminal neuralgia situations, combination of, of that constant with paroxysmal, even situations where there, as, as Dr. Bruce is saying, where there is, it is predominantly constant and there really isn't any uh, paroxysmal component. If it started with paroxysmal and therefore I think that this is uh, idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia and there's vascular compression, I'll consider doing uh, decompression. Uh, and, I, and I think this is, this is a tough, this is a tough call, and I think you can talk with your patients about it as, as um, you know, type one, vascular compression, happy to do an MVD. Type two or extreme type two, i.e. very uh, sort of persistent pain, minimal paroxysms, but there's a vessel there. You know, you, you have this 
uh, you can go either way. Do you want to do you want a craniotomy and go for the cure, uh, or are you willing to do neuromodulation? Remember, neuromodulation uh, rarely cures pain. It's a way to help you deal with it, um, and and so you're committing yourself to a lifetime of of an implanted device, um, and you're not going to get uh, a complete effect. But on the other hand, you don't have to undergo a craniotomy. There's another nuance to this, which is that if you do do the the microvascular decompression, you've got already you already have craniotomy and mesh and an incision behind the ear, uh, and uh, at least with the trigeminal stimulation so far, we've depended on anchoring uh, the system behind the ear. So, so the, the two main targets we've used for neuromodulation are either uh, the trigeminal ganglion root and, and third division uh, by placing uh, an electrode up through the foramen ovale and, and soft passing it so that it, it extends through the porous trigeminus. Um, we originally, I did this at, with a, a temporary externalization wire, uh, because it's kind of involved to put these leads in. Uh, but I think that the temporary externalization wires, uh, were making it harder to do prolonged trials. Um, so we simply do a stage one where we put in the trigeminal lead either alone or together with a, an infraorbital or superorbital, uh, lead that's placed just under the galea in, in the face. Um, and tunneled out at approximately the sideburn, um, which is where we will tunnel the, the facial, uh, rather the trigeminal lead up the face. Some, some, uh, the, some docs out there are also doing mandibular branch uh, uh, peripheral nerve stimulation as well. So you have the, the th peripheral nerve stimulation of the three branches, or you can place this transframinal valley lead, um, which the distal element, the distal uh, part of the lead uh, will stimulate the root. Uh, the more the the central part will pick up ganglion, and the and the proximal end will pick up the third division. Um, we've used the superorbital and infraorbital leads to spread current, run current between the trigeminal lead and the lead in the face, um, so as to steer current up towards uh, the first and second divisions. But admittedly, it's harder to get uh, neuropathic pain in the forehead. Uh, than it is to get the jaw just because of the anatomy um, with this. Um, I agree with, with Dr. Naruz that, that custom leads uh, are, are going to improve these outcomes. Uh, we need better anchor systems. Um, I've begun to, to, to uh, attempt this with the Abbott DRG system, uh, which uh, for those of you who have used the Abbott DRG system, uh, always asks for strain relief loops implanted deep. Um, to prevent migration when you do it in the spinal canal. These same kinds of loops can be created below the skull base to resist, uh, resist pull out, but that, that's a work in progress. Bottom line is um, a system that incorporates an anchor is going to do better in the long run. A system that gives us more three-dimensionality with respect to distribution of the electrodes is going to do better. Um, that's sort of next generation. Uh, having said that, the, the subcompact lead uh, uh, that's made for spinal cord stimulation by Medtronic percutaneous um, actually fits quite well. And, and I've written about this. The other direction uh, that we've gone, and, and this is really, uh, I think uh, I was encouraged to do this by Ahmad Braslan, is to target the nucleus caudalis. I was uh, skeptical that this was a would be a valid target initially, because as we all know, the nucleus caudalis extends past uh, the, the frame and magnum. Uh, having said that, uh, we go in and we place an open lead anterior grade up to the skull base uh, under C1 and, and just under the, the tip of C2 to cover nucleus caudalis and the, and the um, off center. So the, the midline of the lead uh, sits right at, right at the midline. So you can pick up dorsal columns there as well as the nucleus. Um, and uh, we, we run that out with a temporary externalization wire uh, and let the patients go for a week or two. Um, this can be challenging because that incision is, is also painful. Um, so at times uh, when patients aren't recovering from, from the pain, I'll just clip the temporary externalization wire, let it sit, let them heal, come back, put in a second temporary externalization wire, and then they do the trial to see if it's going to work. Um, but but we've have have had great success with this, and I think that uh, that approach 
is actually one of my tricks for dealing with these mixed uh, type two trigeminal neuralgic conditions um, because uh, you really want to leave the foramen ovale open um, because as we know, trigeminal neuralgia recurs. So it's, it is possible to target the nucleus caudalis uh, with neuromodulation, treating that constant component, which is resistant to, to transferaminal ablation um, and leave the foramen open in case they have recurrent type one pain um, to do lesional approaches there. Um, so that's, that's been my general uh, preference with regard to neuromodulation. And I always encourage patients to try neuromodulation before uh, uh, attempting either trigeminal tractotomy or caudalis stress because uh, these neurologic complications can, can be permanent. Uh, and uh, I've seen quite a lot of a proprioceptive deficit in the ipsilateral arm with tractotomy. I've seen a lot of, of ataxia largely uh, improves or, or goes away with caudalis stress. But again, it's a very invasive procedure. Do you have any experience with those timed leads in Europe, at least in one center in Belgium? I, this was like five years ago. I, mm -hmm. I witnessed that they are using like a small timed lead in the foramen ovale. So the, the, the history of that is, is kind of a little bit perverse, uh, perverse if, if it's what I think. There, there was a custom lead that was made in the intellectual property is owned uh, by Medtronic. Um, back in the, in the 90s, I believe, uh, they created a monopolar lead with tines that could be deployed. Um, and there was a single investigator uh, who had been using this system uh, in placing it the way I described, um, that those tines being deployable so that it prevent uh, migration. And then you could, you could retract them to pull the lead out. Um, the problem with that lead was it just had, it was monopolar at a single contact. Um, so, so naturally uh, the trend over time with spinal cord stimulation, for example, has been to have more complex arrays that allow more flexibility of programming. Um, so at least if that's the lead that, that you're talking about, it existed, um, the, the Medtronic ran a trial on it, but the trial failed to meet its primary endpoint uh, and was largely abandoned by, by Medtronic, though the primary investigator published his series and was quite positive about it. Similarly, there's a custom lead that was created that is that looks like a sun keys clip. It is literally a, a, a bracelet that can be clipped on um, that is has silicon with four contacts in it that go circumferentially that can be placed through a suboccipital approach that we use for microvascular decompression. Um, this was originally developed actually in England as a custom lead. Again, it's over in the EU because custom devices have a much more streamlined path. Um, was never released in the United States, uh, but the, the gentleman uh, who worked with it uh, for constant neuropathic pain um, reported uh, that he had had great results with it. Um, and that same lead was also used to try to treat tinnitus by clipping it on the seventh, eighth nerve. So, so there have been, there are devices out there. They're just not uh, available for, for uh, use by, by common practitioners. Um, so I agree in the long run, the future of neuromodulation is gonna be for some company, small or large, uh, to develop a custom system. I personally have been out uh, campaigning for this, speaking to Medtronic, speaking to Abbott, trying to work with small companies to develop products. Um, my opinion is that that what will happen eventually is that a small company will come out with a nice lead, will start to use it, it'll start to look positive um, because it fills a niche that just isn't being filled. Uh, and then one of the bigger companies will, will buy that company and, and it will be available. Um, but uh, we have a, a bit of work to do before that's available. I want to thank our listeners and also to the uh, CNS and NANS for supporting this joint collaboration for this innovative series. Uh, Dr. Boulos, Dr. Naruz, thank you both very, very much for your time to discuss this very challenging topic in our fields. Uh, I hope our listeners will be able to join us again for our future episodes and also for the interactive webinar that's going to be moderated by the faculty from these podcasts. This is a jointly funded and conceptualized project uh, from the education committees of NANS and CNS. Well, thank you everyone and have a great evening.